You're standing in your living room, holding your grandfather's vintage Rolex Submariner. It's been in your family for decades, but life happens, and you need to sell it. The watch has that perfect patina, the kind that collectors go crazy for. You've invited four of your friends over for a private auction, a sealed bid auction, where everyone writes down their offer and the highest bid wins. Simple enough, right? You hand out four envelopes and four slips of paper. You open the first envelope slowly. Bid number one. $3,200. Your friend Marcus, always the bargain hunter. You know vintage submariners in good condition go for around $8,000 to $12,000 these days, so this is, well, it's insulting, honestly. You set it aside and reach for the second envelope. Bid number two, $8,500. Now we're talking. Your friend Sarah clearly did her homework. This is right in the ballpark of what you expected. A fair market price for a watch like this. You nod appreciatively. Bid number three. $11,000. Whoa, your friend David is serious. He's offering a 30% premium over the typical market rate. Maybe he really wants this watch. Maybe he knows something about the market you don't. You look at the fourth and final envelope. You tear it open. Bid number four, $100,000. What? You exclaim. Jennifer, are you insane? This is a nice watch, but it's not that nice. What are you doing? You see, what Jennifer knows and what you forgot to mention to your friends is that this isn't a normal sealed bid auction. This is a Vickrey auction, named after economist William Vickrey, who formalized it in 1961. In a Vickrey auction, the highest bidder wins, but they don't pay their own bid. They pay the second highest bid. Jennifer just bid $100,000, a completely absurd amount that guarantees she'll win. But she's not paying $100,000. She's paying David's $11,000 bid. She just secured your grandfather's Rolex for $11,000 by dramatically overbidding everyone else. That's, that's actually brilliant, you admit grudgingly, handing her the watch. I know, she says. Game theory, baby. But here's where the story gets really interesting. Overbidding in a Vickery auction is actually a terrible idea. Jennifer got lucky this time, but she could have been in serious trouble. Before we dive into why Jennifer's aggressive bid was dangerous, we need to understand the landscape of auctions. The English Auction You're probably most familiar with the English Auction. This is your classic auction house scenario. The auctioneer starts at a low price, people raise their paddles and shout out increasingly higher bids, and eventually only one person is left standing. Highest bid wins. Then there's the Dutch Auction, which works in reverse. The auctioneer starts at a price so high that nobody would pay it, and then rapidly drops the price. $45,000, $40,000, $35,000, the first person to say yes wins immediately and pays that price. It's called a Dutch auction because it's how they sell flowers at markets in the Netherlands. The sealed bid auction, which brings us to sealed bid auctions. Everyone submits their secret bid simultaneously. No one knows what anyone else is offering. The highest bid wins and pays exactly what they bid. It sounds fair, but here's the problem. It creates a strategic nightmare. Then comes the Vickery auction. The Vickery auction is a variation with one crucial twist. The winner pays the second highest bid, not their own. William Vickery proposed this in his 1961 paper. For this work, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1996, just three days before he died. But why would you structure an auction this way? The answer is beautiful. It makes honesty the optimal strategy. So what's the problem with normal auctions? Let's think about what Sarah was going through when she wrote down her bid of $8,500. Sarah knows vintage Rolex submariners typically sell for $8,000 to $12,000. She's done her research. She's determined that this particular watch is worth exactly $9,000 to her. That's her true valuation. If she pays $9,000 or less, she's happy. If she pays more, she's overpaying. So in a normal sealed bid auction, should she bid $9,000? Sarah knows she's not bidding in a vacuum. She's up against Marcus, David, and Jennifer. She starts thinking, David's pretty knowledgeable about watches, so he might bid competitively. Let's say Sarah figures David might bid anywhere from $7,000 to $10,000, with each price equally likely. If she bids her true value of $9,000, she'll win roughly 67% of the time. That's not bad. But wait, the power of bid shading. What if Sarah bids $8,500 instead? $500 below her true value? Now she only wins 50% of the time when David bids below $8,500. But here's the key. Every time she wins, she saves $500.
Let's do the math. Scenario 1. Bidding. True value. $9,000. Wins 67% of the time. Pays $9,000 when she wins. Expected value. 0.67 multiplied by the difference between $9,000 and $9,000 equals $0 in surplus value. Scenario 2. Bidding $8,500. Bid shading. Wins 50% of the time. Pays $8,500 when she wins. Gaining $500 in surplus. Expected value. 0.50 multiplied by the difference between $9,000 and $8,500 equals $250 in surplus value. By shading her bid down by $500, Sarah increases her expected surplus by $250. Yes, she loses out on 17% of auctions she could have won. But in those cases, David was bidding between $8,500 and $9,000, meaning even if she'd won, her surplus would have been small. The cost of losing those marginal victories is outweighed by the savings when she wins with a lower bid. This is called bid shading, and it's rational behavior in a standard sealed bid auction. But here's where things get messy. Everyone does it. If Sarah's shading her bid, so is David, so is everyone else. It creates uncertainty. Sarah has to guess not just David's true valuation, but also how much he's shading. It's complex, and it leads to outcomes that aren't optimal for anyone. Now, let's replay the scenario as a proper Vickery auction, where everyone knows the rules. Sarah still values the watch at $9,000. She still suspects David might bid somewhere between $7,000 and $10,000. But now she knows the winner pays the second highest bid. Should she still bid $8,500 to try to game the system? Let's think through what happens with different strategies. Strategy A. Bid her true value, $9,000. If Sarah bids $9,000, if the second highest bid is $7,000, she pays $7,000, gains $2,000 in surplus. If the second highest bid is $8,000, she pays $8,000, gains $1,000 in surplus. If the second highest bid is $8,500, she pays $8,500, gains $500 in surplus. If the second highest bid is $10,000, she loses but wouldn't have wanted to pay that anyway. Strategy B. Bid higher than true value. $10,000. If Sarah bids $10,000 to guarantee a win. If the second highest bid is $7,000, she pays $7,000. Gains $2,000. Same as before. If the second highest bid is $8,000, she pays $8,000. Gains $1,000. Same as before. If the second highest bid is $9,500, she pays $9,500, loses $500. She's paying more than it's worth to her. Overbidding doesn't help her when she would have won anyway, but it can cause her to win auctions where she ends up paying more than her true valuation. That's bad. Strategy C, bid lower than true value, $8,500. If Sarah bids $8,500, if the second highest bid is $7,000, she pays $7,000, gains $2,000, same as before. If the second highest bid is $8,000, she pays $8,000, gains $1,000. Same as before. If the second highest bid is $8,700, she loses even though she valued it at $9,000 and would have been happy to pay $8,700. Underbidding doesn't save her any money when she wins. She pays the second bid regardless. But it can cause her to lose auctions she should have won. Do you see what's happening? In a Vickery auction, bidding above your true value equals risk of winning and overpaying, no upside. Bidding below your true value equals risk of losing when you should have won, no upside. Bidding your true value equals you win exactly when you should and never overpay. Bidding your true valuation is what game theorists call a dominant strategy. It's the best choice regardless of what anyone else does. By changing one rule, making the winner pay the second price instead of their own, you eliminate all the strategic complexity. Vickery called this property incentive compatibility. The rules of the auction encourage honest revelation of preferences. It also makes it harder for bidders to collude. In a normal auction, if Sarah and David secretly agreed to both bid low, they could suppress the price. But in a Vickery auction, someone else could just bid high and pay only the second highest bid. Their collusion doesn't protect them. From a seller's perspective, you can trust you're getting a fair price that reflects true market demand. 
you don't need to worry that everyone is strategically shading their bids by 20%. And you think about your grandfather, who bought this watch in 1967 for $250, wore it for 50 years, and never imagined it would one day be the centerpiece of a lesson in game theory. He would have loved that story. And if you did too, press the like and subscribe button.